Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, we just thank you and we praise you for your word. Your word is the truth. We have a ready reception for your word. We're ready to take hold of it. We thank you it's going to bring much fruit in our life as we hear and do it. And we thank you for the covenant that we have with you. And we're going to see the covenant principles be established in us. We're going to possess all of our promises. We thank you and praise you for all that you bring forth this night. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated if you would. We've been sharing with you on the subject of covenants. So important that we understand a covenant. We've seen what a covenant is. It's an unbreakable agreement. It's an agreement between two parties, which if you break it, the penalty is death. And there is two parties to it that have the word of the covenant, which they're to carry out. God has made covenant with man. He has promised to fulfill his word and perform his word. He swore by himself because he could swear by none greater. We've seen scriptures on all of these things. And we see that what a covenant means to God is that he, because he swore by himself to perform it by himself, that he absolutely is going to bring his word to pass in our life as we do our part. You and I have a part to play as well. And the word is the word of the covenant, which you and I are responsible to perform if we're going to see God perform his word in our life. We talked about the covenants in the Old Testament. We saw that covenants began with Noah. Well, when God said that he was not going to destroy the earth again through a flood. And, of course, we see the rainbow continually in the cloud, showing the fact that God is faithful and his promise has always been there, that he will not destroy the earth again with a flood. We also saw that then with Abraham, God made a covenant with him, and he revealed himself as El Shaddai, the Almighty God and pointed out that this covenant was not only with him, that he would bless him and make him a father of many nations, but also was with the seed who was going to come after him, who is Christ. And we see that there was a covenant then made with Moses, the Mosaic covenant. It was a covenant of miracles, and it was one where they also, there was further revelation of God revealing himself, where he revealed himself by the name of Jehovah, revealing the covenant-keeping names of the Lord and the things that he would accomplish for them. And then we saw the Davidic covenant, which was a covenant he made with David, in which he said that he was going to build him a house, and he was also, go also going to establish his kingdom. And it was made also with the seed, who is Jesus. And what house is that? It's the church. Jesus is the cornerstone of the house. You and I are the lively stones, the living stones in the house of God. And also, the kingdom of God was the other part of the Davidic covenant, that the kingdom would come into manifestation. And Jesus now is ruling and reigning as the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And as you and I receive him, we come into the same position as we are now kings under the lordship of Jesus. Now, we have seen the fact in the last, last time we were together this morning that there's a new covenant that has been made. The new covenant was made by Jesus. It was prophesied in Jeremiah chapter 31. And we see that this covenant is a better covenant with better promises. We saw, when we were looking at the covenants, all the different aspects of a covenant. And we saw today in this morning service all the different things, how it's different from the old covenant. We saw the comparison of the old with the new. We saw all the greater things now that we have in the new covenant. And so all these covenant promises that now belong to us in the New Testament, God wants us to possess them. And so we are now going to see that we are, God wants us to enter into the covenant that we have. And how do we enter into it? As we've talked about, the way that we enter into this covenant is through new birth. And it's through receiving the word of God in order to be born again. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 23 says, Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God. You and I receive a brand new spirit and a new heart was prophesied, as we mentioned in Ezekiel chapter 36. And so we come into covenant relationship with the Lord. And we saw that all the things in the Old Testament were all types and shadows and the physical things that he had them do, pointing towards the spiritual realities in the New Testament. And we see that now, the way, of course, having getting born again, what happens? There is a circumcision that takes place. It says in Romans chapter 2, verse 28, He is not a Jew, which is one outwardly. Neither is that circumcision, which is outward in the flesh. That's what they did to enter into the old covenant. But now it's changed. But he's a Jew, which is one inwardly. 
And circumcision is that of the heart in the spirit. Now we get a new spirit and we also get a new heart. And so now we have come into relationship and this is the fulfillment, as we mentioned, of Ezekiel's prophecy in chapter 36 in verse 26. Ezekiel 36, verse 26. A new heart will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you. Therefore, now we have seen this has come to pass, because all these things in the Old Testament, remember, are types and shadows of the spiritual realities. So we see that now Jesus Christ has accomplished these things, and remember that this, anything of the flesh does not avail us whatsoever. It's only that which is of the Spirit which is going to produce results. Galatians 6.15 in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision availeth anything nor uncircumcision. What, what counts? It's becoming a new creature, being born again, receiving a brand new spirit, the spirit of Jesus Christ. And of course, that's what happens when we get born again. We receive the spirit of Jesus Christ, and we are now a new creature in Christ, as we see in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. That's how we come into covenant relationship by new birth, and we get a brand new spirit on the inside of us. Now, the next thing that God wants us to realize is that we have come into an inheritance. We see over in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 2 says, here, verse 3 says, that blessed be the God and Father, of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again. This means we've been born again. This word means born again. We've been born again unto what? A lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to what? To an inheritance that is incorruptible, undefiled, that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you. You and I have come into an inheritance and this inheritance has been obtained for us by Jesus Christ. And we see that now, as we've been born again, the Bible says over in Romans chapter 8, verse 17, as we get born again, now God is our heavenly Father, and you and I are now children of God. It says in Romans 8, 17, if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ. That means everything that he is an heir of, you and I are an heir of. You're a joint heir with Christ. All the things that he's given, that we belong to us in Christ, we can obtain them all. Galatians chapter 4, verse 6 tells us what happens when we get born again. We got the spirit of his son coming into our heart, crying, Abba, Father. We're in relationship with him. And it says now you're no more a servant. That's what they were in the Old Testament. But now we're a son. And if a son, they're an heir of God through Christ. We have this inheritance that now belongs to us in Christ. And you and I are to possess this inheritance. Now we see that in the Old Testament, as we pointed out, talking about inheritance, in Genesis chapter 15, we talked about the covenant that was made with Abraham. And we saw in verse 6, this is a couple times back, that Abraham believed in the Lord, and it was counted to him for righteousness. And he said, I am the Lord that brought thee out of the earth of the Chaldees to give this land to inherit it. He gave him an inheritance that he was to possess. It was a physical promised land. That is a type of the spiritual promised land, which are the promises of God that you and I are to possess and enter into in our life. And he said, Lord God, whereby shall I know that I shall inherit it? How am I going to know? The way was because God made a covenant with him. As he proceeded, he told him to do the things, take the heifer, the she-goat, the ram, turtle dove, the young pigeon, all these things, and laid them out there. And when the sun went down, the deep sleep came upon Abram. A horror of great darkness fell upon him. He couldn't be awake when God came through. And we come down to verse 17, that when the sun went down, it was dark. Behold, a smoking furnace and a burning lamp that passed between those pieces. And that was God. Coming. And he said, in the same day the Lord made a covenant with Abram. So he made a covenant with him that he had an inheritance that was given unto him. This inheritance now belongs to us in Christ. We see 
that over in Galatians, Galatians chapter 3, as we mentioned that these covenants in the Old Testament were made not only to the person, Abraham, but also to the seed. Not only to, like with David, it was also to his seed. And who is the seed? In Galatians chapter 3, in verse 16, it says, And to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He saith not to seeds as of many, but as of one, and to thy seed, which is who? Christ. In other words, this covenant, the covenants were not only made just with the one, but it was made to the seed, Christ, who was going to come and be the fulfillment of all those in order, of course, to fulfill the Old Testament, and then he brought into being the New Testament as well. Now, we see that he said this covenant that was confirmed before of God in Christ, the law, which was 430 years after, cannot disannul that it should make the promise of none effect. The promise was made. The law didn't make that of none effect. There was going to be a new covenant that was going to come to pass. If the inheritance be of the law, it's no more a promise. It wasn't of the law. They couldn't possess it by the law. They could only possess it by the promise. But God gave it to Abraham by promise. Well, what was the purpose of the law? Remember, the law was put in because of the transgressions. It brought the knowledge of sin, showing them the fact that they needed a Savior, and that they weren't not, were not righteous, and they needed someone to bring forth salvation for them. Till the seed, and who's that? Christ, should come to whom the promise was made. The only one that could realize it was the seed, which was Jesus, who was going to come and accomplish the redemption, fulfill the Old Testament, which is what he did, and bring the New Testament into being. Well, we see, is the law then against the promises of God? God forbid, it wasn't. If there had been a law given which could have given life, verily righteousness would have been by the law. But it couldn't have been, because first you had to have a new creation. He says the scriptures concluded that all are under sin. Everybody sinned and come short of the glory of God. That the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. Now the promises can be given to us as believers receiving Jesus, because when we receive him, we receive everything that he entered into. And he is the one who is the fulfillment of all of these. Before, came, before faith came, we were kept under the law. We were shut up under the faith which should afterwards be revealed. Again, it was only revealed through Jesus Christ. It says the law was our schoolmaster, which is like a guardian, a tutor, to keep us in line and to bring us unto Christ that we might be justified by faith, not by the works of the law. After that faith has come, we're no longer under a schoolmaster. So are we under the law of the Old Testament and Old Testament ways any longer? No, we're not under it any longer. We're now under the New Testament. We are all children of God by faith in Christ Jesus, as it says. And as many as you've been baptized into Christ, that's talking about the baptism of the Holy Spirit, not, the physical, not water baptism. Remember, we've talked about this. You put on Christ. That's the way you come into the body of Christ, by being immersed in the presence of the Holy Spirit who takes out the old spirit and brings the new spirit of Christ in. Remember 1 Corinthians 12, 13. For by one spirit are we all baptized into one body, as the Bible says. And he says, there, there's neither Jew nor Greek, neither bond nor free, neither male nor female, for we're all one in Christ Jesus. We're all one now in Christ Jesus. And then he says, if you be Christ having received the, Jesus as our personal Lord and Savior, then are you Abraham's seed? Because all the promises were made not only to Abraham, but also to the seed. Well, if you are Christ, then you're in the same position as the seed and heirs according to the promise. That means all of the promises of God in the Old Testament covenants. One was made to Abraham, the one was made to David, all these things. When you receive Jesus as personal Lord and Savior, you're in the same position as the seed. And all of these promises now belong to us in Christ. Remember, we are a joint heir with Christ. And so this inheritance now comes to us through, once we're born again, we have an inheritance which is all the promises of the covenant that belong to us. We see in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 11, In whom also we have obtained an inheritance. You're in Christ. You now have obtained an inheritance. It legally belongs to you. 
being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. Predestination is that we are, uh, uh, go in and possess the inheritance that has been given to us. Is now it belongs to us in Christ. And we are to possess it in our life. Now he also talks about, down in verse 13 and 14, he says, In whom you also trusted, after that you heard the word of truth. You heard the word, which is the gospel, the gospel of your salvation, you got born again. In whom also, after you believed, this is following believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Notice, the Holy Spirit is one of the promises. That means you didn't get it when you're born again. You get it after you're born again is a promise that you receive. As it says, it is the earnest or the down payment of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession. So what should happen? First of all, when we come to the Lord, we receive Jesus as personal Lord and Savior, we get born again. Then what should happen? The first thing we should then receive is the Holy Spirit to come and dwell in us. When you are talking to people about Jesus and bringing them to be born again, and you get them to pray a prayer to receive Jesus, don't stop there. The next thing you do is tell them about receiving the Holy Spirit. What did they get when they got born again? The Spirit of Jesus Christ. What do they need next to receive? The Holy Spirit to come and dwell in them. And that is very important. Remember, we have talked about this, but for you who may not be established in this, it is important that you understand that the Holy Spirit is part of our inheritance received after we are born again. Acts 8.5, Philip went down to the city of Samaria, preached Christ to them, that people with one accord gave heed to the things that Philip spake. They believed. And in verse 12, it indicates that they believe Philip preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus. Well, they got born again. Then they were baptized. Water baptism follows having been born again. Well, what did they have? The spirit of Jesus Christ, the spirit of his son. Then what? Verse 14, when the apostles at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent unto them Peter and John. Well, what are Peter and John going to come down and do? It says, when they were come down, they prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit. That meant they must not have received the Holy Spirit when they were born again. That's right. Receiving the Holy Spirit is after you're born again. For yet he was fallen upon none of them, only they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. They laid their hands on him and they received the Holy Spirit. The receiving of the Holy Spirit is after a person is born again, because that Spirit comes to dwell in our spirit. Now, that's part of our, pro our promises. But we have to understand, remember, we're a joint heir with Jesus Christ. And in Hebrews chapter 1, and verse 2, it says, Hath in these last days spoken to us by his Son, who brought the new covenant into being, which is what we're in, whom he hath appointed heir of all things. All things, which are all the promises of God that are ours that belong to us. He is the heir of all things. Well, if he's the heir of all things and we're a joint heir with Christ, what's that make you and me? Heir of all things. You have an inheritance of all of the promises of God. They belong unto you. And you are to possess them in your life. We can see in Hebrews chapter 6, talking about these promises and the inheritance, the covenant that we have. Hebrews 6, 13. When God made promise to Abraham, because he could swear by no, no greater, he swore by himself. He swore by himself. Remember, he magnified his word above his name. He was going to perform his word. And he swore by himself because he could swear by none greater. Saying, surely I'll bless thee, and multiplying, I'll multiply thee. So after he patiently endured, he obtained the promise. So here we see the promise was obtained. And he said, men verily swear by the greater, but an oath for confirmation is to them an end of all strife. But God, when God, wherein God, we're more willing more abundantly to show unto the heirs of promise, Who's that? You and me. The immutability of his counsel confirmed it by an oath. He swore by himself. So you must understand that when you are in covenant relationship and now you have an inheritance that belongs to you in Jesus Christ as a child of God, that this covenant has been sworn to by God that he would perform it. This is why you can have absolute faith and know exactly what God will do in performing his word. That is so important. Now, what else are we heirs of? We're heirs of all things, but we see that we're also referred to as heirs of salvation in Hebrews 1.14. Here it's talking about angels, and what do angels do? 
Angels minister for the Lord and carry out the service of the Lord. It says, are they not all ministering spirits? The context is talking about angels here. And he says, the angels, they are they not all ministering or serving spirits. They perform service for the Lord. And what are they to do? Sent forth to minister for them who shall be the heirs of salvation. That means the angels of God are available now and their service is for us. One of the aspects of their service is to minister for us, the heirs of salvation, to bring all these promises into being in our life. Angels are to be put into operation. And remember, how do angels get put into operation? One of the ways is through prayer. Remember that Jesus said in Matthew 26, down in verse 53, Thinkest thou that I cannot now pray to my Father, and he shall presently give me more than twelve legions of angels. This is when he was giving himself in the garden over to the band of soldiers that were brought, Judas brought in. He was giving himself into their hands to go into the cross, of course, to accomplish the redemption. He said, I could have prayed to my Father, and he would have sent the angels to deal with this thing and deliver me out of this. Well, you've got to know that that tells you that you could pray to the Father to send forth angels to minister for you, to deliver you, and to minister on your behalf to protect you. The angels will have charge over those and keep you in all your ways, but you've got to put them in operation. It's not automatic. You're going to pray to see them be put in operation. Also, we must understand that when you speak God's word and confess his word, angels hearken to the voice of the word. We see in Psalms 103, Verse 20, bless the Lord, ye his angels, that excel in strength. Not a good translation, actually. The word excel means they're mighty. It's the word gabor, mighty and have great force. In strength, this word is the word koak. We've looked at it before, and it refers to a, a manifested power, strength coming forth out of them. Angels are mighty in manifesting strength and power. And what do they do? They do his commandments and they hearken to the voice of his word. Well, they're going to perform the commandments. That means when you do the commandments, the angels then are going to perform these in your life. They're going to hearken to the voice of the word when they hear the word spoken. Well, when is the word spoken? You and I are the ones that speak the word. And what happens when you speak the word? Remember that now in the New Testament, you are a priest, a king and a priest before God, and you have a free, open way into the presence of God, and you can speak forth His Word in prayer to see the promises of God coming to pass. Well, what happens when we confess the Word of God or Jesus, because Jesus and the Word are one? Here's the principle, Luke 12, 8. I say unto whosoever shall confess me, that's talking about Jesus, and who is Jesus? Jesus is the Word. The principle is you confess Jesus or you confess the word before men. Him shall the Son of Man confess before the angels of God. See, Jesus takes the word that you speak and he confesses it before the angels. What do they do? They go forth to perform that word. This is why your words are important, what you confess. If you deny them before men, you'll be denied before the angels of God. That tells you something. Angels don't automatically work for you. They will only work if they're put into operation. That's why your words are very important. We need to only speak right words in order to see the promises come to pass. So the angels are going to minister for us if we meet the conditions, obviously, of speaking the word and doing his commandments, as well as praying to put the angels in operation, and they will come on the scene to bring our inherited promises to pass. Now we see in James something else. Remember... Well, first of all, we'll look here in Revelation. Remember what happened to us when we got born again. You became a king and a priest unto God. Revelation 1.6, he's made us kings and priests unto God and his Father. You are a king, you're able to rule and reign. And you are a priest, now you can come into the presence of God and minister unto him, and you have free access into the presence of God now. As a king... What are you to do? You are to rule and reign. Remember that what it says in Colossians 1.13, when you got born again, you've been delivered from the power of darkness. The word power, by the way, is a Greek word, exousia, which means authority. 
Young's corrects the King James error. You've been delivered from the authority of darkness, which was Satan's authority that was over us before we're born again. And what you've been brought into? You've been translated into the kingdom of his dear son. You have come into the kingdom of Jesus Christ. And you now are a king. You've got to understand that this is part of your inheritance as we see. In James chapter 2, verse 5, remember the Davidic covenant was about the kingdom of God establishing his kingdom. Well, I say that's talking about Jesus. That's right, but you know, we're also have the seed in us because we received Jesus. Therefore, you also in a position to rule and reign as a king. James 2, 5 says, Hearken, my beloved brethren, hath not God chosen the poor of this world rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which he has promised to them that love him? Heirs of the kingdom. Part of your inheritance in this covenant relationship is now you're an heir of the kingdom. That means you now have the right to rule and to reign. It's a promise. But notice at the same time, does this automatically work for every Christian? No. How do you know? Because it gives us a qualifying statement here. Heirs of the kingdom, which he's promised to who? Them that love him. Well, who are the ones that love him? The ones that keep his commandments. Not just every born-again Christian. There's lots of born-again Christians out there that do not walk in the ways of the Lord. They are not doing the New Testament commandments. They're not hearkening to his voice. They're just walking in their own ways. Are they going to rule and reign? No. If you love me, keep my commandments. If we will keep the commandments of the Lord, which is the New Testament commandments, remember we're in the New Testament now, and there are commandments of the New Testament that you and I are to carry out. You and I are heirs of the kingdom, and God will bring us into that place of ruling and reigning. Because remember, you are a priest before God. And we pointed out that this priesthood, actually, if we go back to Exodus, we see when this was prophesied, because all these things of the Old Testament were prophesied and part of the covenant that they had set in the Old Testament that was going to be fulfilled by Jesus Christ. Remember in the Old Testament that only one tribe was of the priesthood. It was the tribe of Levi. But now, this statement was made in Exodus 19, verse 5. Now, therefore, if you will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant... Then you'll be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for the earth's mine. And you shall be unto me a kingdom of priests. Who's he speaking it to? All of the people. And a holy nation. Could that be fulfilled in the Old Testament? No. They couldn't come into the kingdom. And they all couldn't be priests because only one tribe was of the priesthood. It was the tribe of Levi. And you had to be born into it. What about all the rest of them? They couldn't be born into it. This is talking about in the New Testament when this is now fulfilled because in the New Testament, now we are born into the family of God. How? By being born again. And what happens when we're born again? We've come into the priesthood. That's how you enter into it, by spiritual birth. Old Testament was physical birth, brought you into the priesthood of the tribe of Levi. Now everybody who's born again by spiritual birth comes into the priesthood. And now what are we? As it says, we are now because we saw kings and priests unto God. And we see in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 5, you as lively stones, what's that speak of? Well, the house of God is built, you know, built stones, and Jesus is the cornerstone of the house of God. Remember, the Davidic covenant was he was going to build them a house. And this house, Jesus is the cornerstone of building this house, which is the New Testament church, the church of the firstborn, that we all enter into when we're born again. It says we are, build up a, are being built up a spiritual house. The house is being built, a spiritual house. That's what you gotta build in your life. A holy priesthood. You're now a holy priest because you have a twofold priesthood. A holy priesthood, and what are you to do? Offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. That's again, remember that the Old Testament were all the physical types and shadows of the spiritual realities. Did they have to offer up sacrifices in the Old Testament? Yes, they did. Daily sacrifices, physical sacrifices, all types of one. They had the sin offering, they had the burnt offerings, they had the trespass offerings, they had the thank offerings, all these different offerings they had to offer up. 
Well, do you and I have offerings and sacrifices? Yes, we do. What sacrifices? Spiritual sacrifices that we are now to offer up acceptable to God, which is praise and worship, you doing the works of God and carrying out the ministry of the Lord and having fellowship to minister to other people. We also see in verse 9, the second part of this priesthood, you're a chosen generation, a royal priesthood. That's a ruling, reigning priesthood. A holy nation, remember that prophecy? Was that they would be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation? A peculiar people, all that was said in Exodus chapter 19, verse 6, spoke of that. That you should show forth the praise of him who has called you out of darkness into the marvelous light. You and I, now having come into the light by being born again, are not only a holy priest, but we're also a royal priest. You are a ruling, reigning. The royal means kingly, royal or kingly. You and I are to operate as a king in ruling and reigning under the lordship of Jesus Christ. And we are to carry out the things that God wants for us. Now, this inheritance, this kingdom is belonging to us. And remember that this king, it speaks of in Matthew 25, down in verse 34, when he said to the ones who are on the right hand, the ones that obeyed him and did the things that he told them to do, Come, you blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. You say, well, I thought that I already have come into the kingdom. Well, you have, but there's a further aspect of it because everything that you are doing now is going to be looked at by the Lord when we are before him, and we are going to be rewarded according to our works, and in the life to come, we're going to be set in some position. And if we have done the things that he says, we're going to inherit the position of ruling and reigning. He may say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Have authority over ten cities. You're going to enter into ruling and reigning. Inherit the kingdom is prepared from you from the foundation of the world. You see, this kingdom is not just ruling and reigning over the devil for this time, because we are doing that, but it's also ruling and reigning in the life to come as well. God wants us to understand that what you are doing is so important because everything you are doing in this covenant relationship is going to affect you. You're going to be rewarded according to all of your works. We also see that the inheritance that will come to us is going to come through the Word of God and through us having the knowledge of God. It's interesting what it says here when it's speaking about husbands and wives. It says in 1 Peter 3, 7, Likewise, ye husbands, dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honor to the wife as under the weaker vessel, as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers be not hindered. Heirs together of the grace or the favor of life, which comes through Jesus. And notice, how are you going to be able to see this inheritance? It's going to be because of dwelling according to knowledge. The knowledge is the knowledge of the Word of God. When we have the knowledge of the Word of God and we're walking in line with the Word of God, then His Word is going to bring forth the blessings of God. The grace of life is going to come forth for us. And notice, because you dwell according to knowledge, if you start doing what's right in His sight and you start praying the Word and you are dwelling according to the Word, then your prayers will not be hindered, as it says. Remember, over in Acts, in chapter 20, Verse 32, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace. How is God's that grace of life going to come to you? Through the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance. See, the word is the word of the covenant. It's the word that's going to give you the inherited promises that belong to you in Jesus Christ. It's among all those who have been sanctified, this happens to be, a perfect tense <coughs> verb, meaning that these ones who have been sanctified, it's completed action with present results. These perfect tense, for you here the first time, we talk about this and we explain it. It's important to understand what's being said. Here, it's talking about someone who has been sanctified, and the sanctification process, remember, is an ongoing work in our life. And here it says that it's perfect tense, which is completed in the past with ongoing effects at the time of the speaking, which means 
You're going to walk in that holiness. You're going to walk in sanctification and be holy as he is. Those are the ones that are going to possess the inheritance. It is important that you realize that in order to possess your promises and your inheritance, you must come to the place of being holy before the Lord. Some people think, well, I'm just, I just got a promise. I can just go and take hold of that promise however I want. No, it doesn't work that way with God. First of all, you're going to meet his conditions. And Obadiah verse 17 shows us the conditions of how you come to the place of possessing your promises, the possessions, the inheritance that belongs to you. First of all, it says, upon Mount Zion shall be deliverance. God wants us to get delivered. What are we to get delivered of? Delivered of all sin? Delivered of all the works of the flesh? Delivered of all the evil spirits as we cast them all out? Delivered of the things of this world? So we're walking in holiness and walking in the ways of the Lord. Because what does deliverance produce? Holiness. It produces holiness in our life. And when we are holy, having been sanctified, that word of gra grace that builds us up, that will give us our inheritance, it will bring that to pass. Because what happens with the guys who are holy? The house of Jacob shall possess their possessions. That means they're going to possess the promises of God in their life. God wants us to possess all the promises of God. But we must understand that this is going to be a process of you growing up to possess these things that belong to you. It says in Galatians chapter 4, verse 1, he says, Now I say that the heir, as long as he's a child, and this word child here is this word napios, which means an infant. So this is someone who's just brand new in the Lord is what it's a type of. What happens when we get brand new in the Lord? We're supposed to desire the sincere milk of the word that we might grow thereby, get the word to begin to grow up in the things of God. Even though he's an heir, he's got to write for all these principles, all these promises, all these things that belong to him. As long as he's a child, if he has not grown up in the word of God, he differs nothing from a servant. Though he's in the position of being Lord of all, because the only way you're going to come to possess the inheritance is you've got to grow up in the things of God and walk after the knowledge of God to be built up and to become sanctified and holy before him so you can possess the inheritance that belongs to you in Christ. So even though there's lots of Christians out there, they're heirs, but they're still in infants spiritually, and they're nothing different from a servant because they can't possess anything until they come to the place of having the knowledge of God and walking in line with it to, in order to be able to be built up and possess their inheritance, even though they're in the position legally of being Lord of all. Well, they're not possessing anything yet. This is why we've got to grow up in the things of God. We've got to come out of all carnality. Many people just think, well, I'm just going to claim a promise and that's it. I wonder why it's not coming to pass. Well, we have to meet the conditions of God's word. He says in 1 Corinthians 3, 1, Brethren, I speak not, I could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, as unto babes, nepios, infants in Christ. They were still not grown up in the things of God. They were still infants spiritually. He said, I fed you with milk and not with meat, for hitherto you were not able to bear it. Neither yet now are you able. These guys were carnal, as he says. For whereas there's among you envying, strife, divisions, are you not carnal and walk as men or just like the men out there in the world? Just walk as a regular human being, this means. That means they're carnal. That means if we're walking in envy, strife, and divisions, we're still carnal. We're still spiritual infants. God wants us to come out of that. Remember, we are commanded to walk in love. We should not have any envy or strife or divisions whatsoever. He wants us to come out of all of that. Also, if we are not coming to the place of getting free from the ways of sin and the ways of the world and walking in God's ways, as it said here, even though he's a, servant, he's a Lord of all, he's still nothing different from a servant. He's under the tutors and governors until the time appointed of the Father. Even so, we, when we were children, infants, were in bondage under the elements of the world. What he's saying is, even though we're born again, you can still be in bondage under the elements of the world because you haven't come to the knowledge of the truth and been a doer of the word in order to possess the promises of God in your life. God wants us to come to the place of possessing everything. This is why we've got to get established in the doctrine of Christ, which is the word of God, in order to possess our inherited promises, the covenant promises that belong to us. See, just because you have a covenant 
doesn't mean that you're going to possess these things unless you grow up in the things of God. We see in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 14, that henceforth we be no more children, nepios, nepios, infants, spiritual infants, tossed to and fro, carried about with every wind of doctrine, whatever wind comes down, whatever's blowing, by the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. See, so many Christians out there, they've heard so many different things, and they got all these things. They don't really have, they don't know what's the truth. They're not really established in anything. They really haven't heard the word. They've heard all these different things, but do they know it, and are they established in themselves? No. They're tossed to and fro. They're still nepios. They're still spiritual infants. And they're still, they're not possessing the promises in their life because they haven't, cut, they're still being tossed about with every wind of doc, darkness, of, of, doc, of doctrine, all these do, doctrines that come. And remember, the devil's brought all kinds of doctrines into the church, as we see. Now, in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, he says over here in verse 11, When I was a child, a nepios, I spake as a child. Otherwise, when I'm an infant, and I don't know the word, I just speak like someone that's carnal, like everybody else. What do your words show? Your words show whether you've grown up in the things of God. Do you speak like the world, or do you speak like a child of God? Are you speaking the word? Are you speaking what you feel? Are you speaking according to just, you know, whatever is going on, like a human being would speak? No, you're born from above. You're not to be speaking like that any longer. He goes on and said, I, underst I understood as a nepios. I thought as a nepios. But when I became a man, aha, this is the guy who's grown up. He said, I put away all these childish things. I put all these things away, these nepios things. God wants you to get the word in you and put away everything that is not of the Lord. You don't have time to waste doing the things of this world. This world is governed by the God of this world. And all the things in the world, he says, they're not of the Father. Remember that scripture over in 1 John chapter 2? As long as you have one foot in the world, you'll never grow up into the things of God. 1 John 2, 15, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. All that's in the world, the loss of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life, it's not of the Father, it's of the world. We're not going to enter into anything. The world pass away and the lust thereof, but who's the one who's going to abide forever and enter into things? The one who does the will of the God abides forever. And who's this guy? The one who's doing this word is one who just didn't do it once in a while. This is a present tense verb, meaning the guy who is doing, as Young's brings out, showing the ongoing tense of the verb. He is doing continually the will of God. That's why God wants you to be continually doing the will of the, of, the, of the Word of God all the time, the will of God. That's why we've got to put the Word first place. Do we have time to waste in our life doing things of this world? No. You don't want to waste your time with those things. Hebrews chapter 5, verse 13. He says, everyone that uses milk, ah, this is the guy that's still spiritually infant, who's not going to be able to possess his inheritance, remember, is the covenant promises. He's unskillful. What does unskillful mean? It means inexperienced. Inexperienced. In the word of righteousness. And what is he? He's still a nepios, a baby. He's still an infant. He hasn't grown up in the things of God. He's not sta established in the word. This is why being a consistent hearer and doer of the word is a key for you to grow up. You may have a lot of knowledge about things, but if you haven't done the word and put it in operation, you can still be a nepios. I don't care if you've been a Christian 30 years. It all comes down to what are you doing with the word? Because these guys were inexperienced, unskillful, or inexperienced. How do I get experience? By doing something. They put you on the job. Are you just going to become a master at that job overnight? No. You do it. You commit experience. And through experience, you get established and you know how to do something. You become uh, efficient and effective at it. Well, you and I are to become experienced in the word of righteousness. And this is the word that God gives us. 
his word of righteousness. And as we walk in line with his word, that is what is going to bring us to the place of possessing our inheritance, because we've got to get built up in the word. Look what it go back to that Acts 20, verse 32 again. Look what he says. Brethren, I commend you to God and the word of his grace. Grace is not automatic. It's the word, it comes through the word of God, the word of his grace, which will do what? It's able to build you up. It's going to build you up. What are you doing? You're building your spiritual house. You're building something. And we are building our spiritual house in us through the word of God, line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little, there a little. There's no shortcuts to it. Hearing and doing the word consistently so we get established in the word and we grow up in the things of God and what's going to happen is we get built up. He's going to give us the inheritance. We're going to possess our inherited promises. It's among all those that have been sanctified. They've come to the place of holiness because they got rid of all the things that are not of the Lord. They, got, they dealt with the sin in their life. They dealt with the fleshly works. They turned away from the things of this world. They're now putting the word of God first place and they're walking in line with the word. And they're being a doer of it. That's what God wants. He wants us to enter into everything that he has for us. We see also in Acts 26, we see in verse 18, the gospel that comes to people is to open their eyes, to turn them from darkness to light. That means we have to come out of everything that's not of light, everything that's not of the word. And from the authority of Satan unto God, we cannot be yielding to the enemy. You say, well, I'm born again. I'm not under the authority of the devil anymore. Well, if you're walking in sin, you're yielding to the devil. You say, wait, 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 what do you mean? I'm born again. I'm not yielding to the devil. I'm not under his authority at all. We'll come back to this in a moment. Not so. We've seen this in Romans chapter 6, but we'll just bring this back by remembrance. Remember what it says? Know you not, to whom you yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants to whom you obey. That's a person, isn't it? Whether of sin unto death. Who would we be obeying if we're sinning? Not God. We're obeying the devil who would want us to sin. Therefore, we are servants of the devil and are yielding to him to operate over us. If we sin, that will produce death and destruction in our life. If we haven't come to the place of putting the word of God first place and walking in the ways of the Lord. You see, we got to turn away from it, from the authority of Satan unto God, so that we can receive, as he says, take hold of, lambano, the forgiveness of sins and inheritance Inheritance can be taken hold of among them which are sanctified by faith in me. Again, this is talking about those that have come to the place of being sanctified, become the place of being holy with ongoing effects at the time of the speaking. And it's going to become because you're going to be walking by faith and you're going to possess all the promises of God with your faith as you enter into everything that God has for you. You see, we got all these promises, which are all the covenant promises that belong to us. But just because you have the promises, does that mean you're going to see them come to pass automatically? No. Look what it says in 2 Corinthians 7, 1. Having therefore these promises, we got all these great promises. Dearly beloved, he tells us to do something. Well, you got all these promises, but there's something you need to do. Because you got to get to the place of being holy so you can possess the possessions, remember? What's he tell us to do? Let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. God wants us to come to the place, having the promises of God, that we're going to cleanse ourselves. Well, whose responsibility is that? You and me have the responsibility to cleanse ourselves from all filthiness. See, this is why we've got to get delivered of all the evil. Many people are just looking for quick you know, I want it now. Give it to me now. That's not God's way. God's way is a total work in your life to bring you out of all bondage, to set you free from sin, to get you out of the ways of this world, to walk in his ways, to put the, the, the crucify that flesh daily, to put the word of God first place, to grow up in all things, to become strong in the Lord, and to walk in his ways after his commandments. And you are going to come to the place then of possessing the promises of God in your life. Now, 
It says, cleanse ourselves from what? Filthiness of the flesh? That means all the fleshly works. What's the filthiness of the spirit? That's all the evil spirits that are in us because there's no filthiness in our spirit. Our spirit is a spirit of Christ we get when we're born again. But the filthiness of the spirit is all the unclean, filthy, or defiled spirits. What's the general term for demons? Unclean spirits used some 20 times in the Gospels. So, we've got to get ourselves cleansed from all these things. Because, are you going to be able to inherit the things of God if you got sin in the camp? And you haven't come to the place of being righteous before the Lord. And by the way, we should, well, we'll cover that in a second. But look over here in verse 9. Look what he says in 1 Corinthians 6, verse 9. Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Oh, they're not going to inherit it. It's not going to happen. Who's the unrighteous? Anybody that's got unrighteousness in them. It hasn't dealt with things. What does sin produce? Unrighteousness. Unrighteousness has to be dealt with. Be not deceived, neither the fornicators, the idolaters, the adulterers, the feminine, the abusers themselves of mankind, that's a homosexual, nor thieves, nor the covetous, nor the drunkards, nor the revilers and extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. We can't inherit the kingdom of God if we're walking in any wrong ways. Some were such, you say, well, boy, does that mean I did that in the past? Does that mean I'm sunk? No. Such were some of you. But what happened? Well, you are washed, you're sanctified, and you're justified in the name of the Lord Jesus by the Spirit of our God. It's very interesting what it says here in the Greek. You were this way, and it says, first of all, you are washed. Now, when it says you are washed, is this talking about a work that God did with no part on your part? No, because it is in the middle voice. The middle, the, in the Greek, there's tenses, voices, and moods. The, mood, the, the voices are very important because there's an active voice, there is a middle voice, and there is a passive voice. The active voice means the subject is doing the action. The passive voice means the subject is being acted upon by another. The middle voice means the subject is doing the action for himself, for his own benefit. Now, it's not saying he does it in his own power, but he's doing what we're doing, and we're doing the Word, which is God doing the work. But you and I have a part to play in. It's not automatically God that's going to wash us clean of all these things. Otherwise, the use of this means you washed yourself, essentially. How do we wash ourselves? Through doing what the Word says. We're going to be cleansed by, through the washing of the water of the Word. You can't do it, do it in your own flesh, of course. It can only be done by the Word of God. And who's doing it when you do what the Word says? God's doing it. But you and I have a part to play. So that means you washed yourself. That means, hey, you did the cleansing, Mark. You did the cleansing process. You went through the cleansing process and got free of all these things. You were then, it says, but you're sanctified. Now this means you've come to the place of being holy, and God is the one who produces that in you. Holiness comes because of doing the Word. God produces the holiness. That's why it's passive voice. Remember, how do we get to the place of holiness, by the way? It also says you're justified or rendered righteous. Same thing, as it says, passive voice in the name of the Lord. Well, how do we get to this place? Let's go back to Romans 6 for a moment. This is why we bring these scriptures up often, because you need to understand what's being said. Remember, you're dead to sin, you're alive unto God. You're not a sinner any longer, you're a servant of righteousness. Don't let sin reign in your mortal body anymore. The only way you let it reign is if you obey it in the lust. That's why you've got to crucify the flesh daily. Don't yield your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God, as it says in Romans 6.13. Remember, if we yield ourselves to, to the, what the enemy, or to sin, we're yielding to the devil. Sin shall not have dominion over you. We don't have to have sin dominion over us any longer. Who you yield yourself to is who you become a servant of. So the key is, what are you yielding to? And when you yield to God, you're being obedient to Him, and that's a key. See, this is all tied in for you to possess your promises and see the covenant blessed promises come to pass. Obedience produces what? Righteousness. 
And what happens when you are righteous? We come down here, and it says, as you yield your members' servants to righteousness, what does that produce? Holiness. Who accomplishes that? God does. And what's evident that you now have become holy? He says, because you have fruit. What fruit? Fruits of righteousness unto holiness. Without fruit, you'll never be holy, and you'll never possess the inherited promises of God in your life. Can we see the promises of God come to pass and win our battles if we have sin in the camp? No. When they had sin in the camp, could they defeat the enemy in the Old Testament? No, they got wiped out. You've got to deal with sin. He says, up, sanctify the people. Remember, he said in Joshua 7, get, these people got to get cleansed. These people got to get holy before they're going to be able to go in and win their battles. God wants us to understand that we must cleanse ourselves from all this filthiness. In Galatians chapter 5, we even see in verse, well, verse 16 following, he says, walk in the spirit. You won't fulfill the lust of the flesh. If we walk in after the lust of the flesh, what are we doing? We're sinning. Are we going to possess our inherited promises and see the covenant blessings come? Nope. It's not going to happen. That's why you've got to crucify the flesh daily. You can never trust your flesh. And what's the voice of the flesh? Your feelings. That's why, listen to what you say. Well, I don't feel like doing this. Well, I don't feel like doing this. I don't feel like praying today. or I don't feel like getting in the Word. That's the flesh just running you. You're not going to be led by your feelings or else you're being led by the flesh. Instead, we're going to be led by the Spirit. The flesh is lusting against the Spirit, talking about your spirit, not the Holy Spirit. Capitals, by the way, are not in the, in, the, in the Greek. It's been put in by the translator erroneously. This is talking about you walking in the Spirit by the Word of God according to your spirit. The flesh is lusting against what? What's the flesh? Your body. Against what? The spirit. What do you have that's brand new on the inside of you? The spirit of Jesus Christ. They're, they're warring against each other. And the spirit against the flesh that you're contrary, the one to the other, so you cannot do the things that you want. If you be led of the spirit, you're not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are manifest. And here he says, remember these works of the flesh? Are we going to inherit into the, possess our inherited promises? No. Adultery fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, that's bridled lust, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, we can't have hatred, variance, that means strife and contention. We can't have strife and contention. That's going to knock you out of your promises. Remember when there's a strife, envy and strife, there's confusion in every evil work, as it says in James? We're not, how, how are we going to possess our inherited promises if we're doing those things? Emulations. This refers to a person with uh, a zeal, negative zeal, like a punitive zeal, an envious zeal to do things. No, we're not going to have that. Wrath. This refers to a anger or a passion. We cannot have anger working in us. God wants you to get delivered from all anger. The Bible, the only way you can ever have anger and not sin, as it says, is you have a righteous anger, remember? Be angry and sin not, a righteous anger. And it's only going to be for a short time. It's not out of the flesh. It's only over something that's been wrong according to the Word of God. It's never out of self. And furthermore, even if it's a righteous anger and you let the sun go down on your wrath, it becomes an area of sin. You can't allow that. And he says, here is strife, which is really one who is partisan and fractious, is what it means, is the, uh, essentially what this means. So the guy is really, he's being partisan or or as a fractious spirit. He's kind of putting himself forward as it talks about. Basically, he's just being selfish. He's just wanting to do everything he wants to do. Seditions. That's divisions. Remember, that made him carnal. Heresies. Now, that'd be anything that's contrary to the Word of God. Envyings. We can't have that. Murders. Drunkenness. Revelings. That's that party spirit. And as such like, of which I tell you before, as I've told you in the past, they which do these th such things, it's not that they've done them once, it's that they're continually doing them because it's a present tense verb. If this is what you're doing, you're not going to inherit the kingdom of God because we've got to get ourselves free from all these things. What does God want? He wants the fruit of the Spirit operating in us. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there's no law. Those that are there, that are, they that are Christ, have crucified the flesh with all of its affections and lusts. This means if you're going to possess your inherited promises in the covenant, you're going to have to crucify that flesh daily. 
If you don't crucify the flesh, you're not going to inherit your promises. You've got to be holy before the Lord. If you have the works of the flesh, you cannot enter into the inherited things that belong unto you. He goes on and says, if we live in the Spirit, which we do now because we're born again, we have the Holy Spirit dwelling in us, let us walk in the Spirit. We are now to walk in the way of the Spirit. How do we walk in the Spirit? By the Word of God. Ephesians 5 even tells it again. Verse 5. He says, For this you know that no whoremonger, nor unclean person, nor a covetous man who's an idolater has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. What's a whoremonger? Well, that's a pornos. That's a person who's involved in fornication. How about an unclean person? That's a guy who's not cleansed. Wait a minute. You mean to tell me if I'm not cleansed, I'm not going to have any inheritance, the kingdom of Christ? That's right. That's why we've got to confess our sins. Remember what the Bible says? If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So, we're going we, to deal with all this. Covetous man, idolater he is. He does ha not have any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. It's interesting that it says the kingdom of Christ and of God. What's that mean? Whose kingdom is now in operation? The kingdom of Jesus Christ. What happens when after he finishes all those things at the end of the millennial reign? It says he gives the kingdom back to God the Father in 1 Corinthians 15. So what's this talking about? You're not going to have inheritance not only in the kingdom of Christ's time, but also in the kingdom of God the Father. It means you're never going to have inheritance, period. It's not going to happen in our life if we don't get ourselves right. This is why we must come to the place of walking in the ways of the Lord. And also, the way you're going to receive your inheritance as you are right before Him is through prayer. Colossians 1.12 says, Giving thanks unto the Father which has made us meet or sufficient and fit to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. When we're giving thanks to the Father, what's that talking about? That's talking about New Testament prayer. If you haven't been here, we've talked about New Testament prayer. Very important, because 99% of the body of Christ does not know how to pray accurately and effectively. You say, boy, that sounds like quite a statement to make. I, I, I would stand on that because they don't understand that the word ask is a word aiteo, which means a demand of something due, which is the way you approach the Father in the New Testament. And the word receive is lambano, a taking hold of promises, and you do it with thanksgiving. Most people are still requesting, petitioning, asking to see if God will do something. No, we don't do that anymore. In fact, we had to go over that for some of you who weren't here for a moment. You've got to understand there's a change in prayer. As we talked about today, we don't pray the Old Testament way any longer. We pray the New Testament way. Jesus revealed the change. And he said in John 16, 23, he said in that day, talking about the day of the new covenant coming to being, you shall ask me nothing. Verily, verily, I say unto you, whatsoever you shall ask the Father in my name, he'll give it you. Well, it looks like I'm asking. Well, let's look at these words. In fact, for a moment, we're going to bring up this other program. I guess we do have it. I do have it up there. In that day you shall ask. This is a word, arateo, which means truly to request or to ask. It's number 2065. Remember that in a moment. You'll see something. The second word, you'd think, well, it's got to be the same Greek word. It's not the same Greek word. Well, that changes things, doesn't it? Verily, verily, I say unto you, whatsoever you shall this is number 154, ateo, not arateo. That you shall ateo, the Father, in my name, he'll give it you. What does these words mean? This particular program shows meanings in this lightning Bible from Strong's Concordance. This is Strong's Concordance being reproduced. And if you go to Strong's Concordance, if you have it in writing, you have, you know, or you got it on your computer, you look up number 4441, which is a comparison of words that are similar, but showing the exact meanings of what they are. You will find that number 2065, remember that was arateo, which meant to ask, request, or favor, of a favor. That means that, request is a favor. How about the other word, ateo, number 154? It means a demand of something due. 
That tells you something. We don't request and ask as a favor any longer. We make a demand of something do us. Why am I making a demand of something do us? You mean I'm going to be making a demand of God of something that's due me? That is a legal term. Because when we make a demand of something do us, that means something must be do us. What's do us? Anything that we did to get it to be do us? No, we do nothing. Remember, everything comes by God's grace, his favor toward us, that's been already given to us. Well, wait a minute. If things are already due us, that means things must already been given to us, that belong to us, that are due us, as I'm a child of God, I'm a joint heir with Jesus, I have a right to all these things. That's right. What are all the things that are due us? All the promises of God have already been given to us. All the promises of God in Him are yes, and in Him, amen. They've already been given to us. We already have an inheritance that belongs to us in Christ. Remember, in 1 Peter 1, verse 4, we have come to an inheritance that's undefiled, fades not in a way, reserved in heaven for you. Your inherited promises already belong to you. And are these blessings, have they been given to us already? Yes, they have. Ephesians 1, 3 says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us. That's past tense, isn't it? He has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. If God already gave us all the promises, already blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places, then they all belong to us and they are due us. Why? Because of what God has done for us. Because of the fact that these things are due us, then what are we supposed to do? We are going to pray to release that which is due us, all the promises of God, to bring them into manifestation in our life. If the promises have already been given to us, do I go and ask, petition, and request God to give them to me? No, that's a denial of what he already did for you. Instead, I'm coming to receive what you've already given to me, what's already due me because I'm in Christ and this inheritance that already has been given to me according to the covenant. This is why this word means a demand of something due. Sorry. As we pointed out, strictly a demand of something due. Now, who are you going to pray to? Are you going to pray to Jesus? No. We don't pray to Jesus. Jesus says, you're not going to come, and, come and, and ask or request anything of me. You're going to now pray to the Father in the name of Jesus because there's a change in New Testament to Old Test from Old Testament to New Testament prayer. You're a child of God. Now you come directly to the Father and you pray in the name of Jesus, which is going through the high priestly ministry of Jesus because he's now the high priest of the covenant. That's why you do everything in the name of Jesus. And he will give it to you. Who's going to give it to you? The Father. Hitherto, up to this time, have you, I tell you, made a demand of what's due you of nothing in my name. I tell you, for ask, make a demand of what's due you. How do I do that? I return, I give the word of what's due me. All these promises are due you. So, here is one of the promises that is due me. I quote the scripture, that's why you pray the word, not the problem. And it says, you shall receive that your joy may be full. Now, this is important. Because the word receive is a Greek word, lambano, which means to take hold of, to take hold of. Not to wait for something to happen. There's two words for receive in the Greek. One of them is dekamai, which means a passive reception, waiting for something to come to me. The other one is lambano, which is an act of taking hold of something for it to come to me. Otherwise, I take hold of it. That's what's used here. In other words, the way that we pray now in the New Testament is that we are going to pray to the Father in the name of Jesus. We are going to pray the word making a demand of what is due us according to spiritual law because all the promises have already been given to us. And when we do it, we're going to do it with thanksgiving as we come unto the Father. Jesus would pray with thanksgiving. You and I, whenever we pray, we're going to do things with thanksgiving. Why? Because thanksgiving shows the fact that it's already been given to me and I'm thanking him as I take hold of it because it's already mine. It's already due me. I'm not coming to ask him to give me something. He already gave it to me. So as I come to take hold of that which he's given me, I say, thank you. 
thank you shows faith, and it shows the fact that I know that the promises are already mine. That's the how you would take hold of it. We see this all at Philippians 4, 6, when it tells us, be careful for nothing, anxious for nothing, in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. We pray with thanksgiving. You read on and say, oh, wait a minute, you said we're not supposed to request anything. That's right. Let your request be made unto God. Sounds like something's wrong here. Well, let's look at the word request. Is it erateo? No. It's a word itema, which is the same. It's just a form of the word iteo, 155, which is right next to 154. It has the same meaning, a demand of what's due you. You let your demands of what's due you be made unto God with thanksgiving. Coming back to what he's saying here then is the fact that you and I now, in the New Testament, are to give thanks unto the Father, that's talking about in prayer, in order to be a partaker of the inheritance that belongs to us, as we are going to take hold of the promises of God that belong to us in Christ. And we're going to receive all of these things with our faith. That's how you're going to enter in to all these things. In fact, we see over in Hebrews, it talks about, in chapter 9, in verse 15, it uses this word lombano again. For this cause, he's the mediator of the New Testament, that's speaking of Jesus, that by means of death, for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the First Testament, they which are called, which is all of us who have, res have responded, everybody's called, remember, he wants everybody to be born again, but the only ones that have responded are the ones who were born again, might receive lombano, take hold of, the promise of eternal inheritance. We can take hold of the promise of eternal inheritance, everything that belongs to us in Christ. And when it talks about that we might receive, it's interesting that this is a subjunctive mood, which means it's not automatic. It depends on you doing what he says. The subjunctive mood in the Greek expresses things that are contrary to fact, that are conditional upon conditions being met. So what this is saying is that they which are called, that's you and me, might take hold of, that's our condition to be met. We gotta take hold of the promise of the eternal inheritance. It's not gonna fall on us. You're gonna take hold of all these things, see? You see, you now have the means to come into the very presence of God. You can take hold of all the promises. By the way, he goes on and says, for where a testament is, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator. You might have been thinking as we've been talking about this, say, inheritance, what's this all about inheritance stuff? Who gets an inheritance? After somebody dies, right? And the will is set. Well, who died? Jesus died. Well, I thought it was the same Jesus that got raised from the dead. No, he was the firstborn from the dead he was born from the dead, not the same one. He got a new spirit himself. A lot of people don't understand that. He was the one who made the will. He died. He's the death of the testator who made the will. For a testimony is a, is a force after men are dead. Jesus died. He paid the price. And then he just didn't come up and get his physical body. The Bible says he was born from the dead born again. He was the first begotten that came into the world. Born, he's the firstborn of every creature, as the Bible says. You remember those scriptures. Jesus was born again. That's why it's called the church of the firstborn. You and I are the church of the firstborn. We get a brand new spirit. Brand new, that's the way we come into it. In fact, how could Jesus come into the priesthood? Think about it. Could the same Jesus who died and then just came up and got his body enter into the priesthood? No, why? Because he was of the tribe of Judah. He wasn't the tribe of Levi. So from the Old Testament standpoint, it just in the, in the flesh, could he get into it? Just because he was in flesh, could he come into it? No. How do you come into the priesthood? You gotta be born into the priesthood. But how do we get into the New Testament priesthood? There's only one way, by spiritual birth. So what did Jesus have to undertake? and undergo an experience. Spiritual birth. He was born from the dead. Otherwise, it has no strength while the testator lives. 
Jesus got born from the dead, and he's brand new. And you and I, that he became the cornerstone of the church, and you and I get born again to come into the church. A lot of people have a hard time with that, but it's the truth. Colossians 1.15 says, He's the, is the image of God, the firstborn of every creature. Not the same Jesus. He got a new spirit. He was born, the firstborn. Look what it says. He's the head of the body. The church was the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. Jesus died, and he paid the price, and he was born from the dead, and he's alive forevermore. And he now, see, see well, how can Jesus be a joint heir? I mean, he's the one who made the inheritance, right? And remember what it said as we go back over to Hebrews chapter 9 again, just to take a look at that. When does a testament come into force after men are dead? Well, if, let's say someone died, and then they got resuscitated back to life. Well, is the inheritance in force? No, it's the same person. They're still alive, aren't they? Otherwise, there's no strength at all while the testator lives. That meant there had to be a new person. And that's exactly what Jesus was. He's the firstborn from the dead. Praise God. So, he now is the firstborn from the dead, and he has the preeminence. You and I get born from the dead. That's how we come into the family of God. And that's uh, because otherwise, how could Jesus be, how could Jesus have an inheritance? If it's the same Jesus that came up, right? It wouldn't work, would it? Wait a minute, Jesus got just, you know, he's the same old Jesus came up. He's got the same body he got, but of course he got glorified, but it wasn't the same spirit. It's a new person because the old him died and the will can't come into being if the same person comes back to life. It's a brand new Jesus, you've got to understand. The firstborn from the dead, otherwise there's no way that the testament could be in force. Praise God. We've got to understand what Jesus did. Remember, he was separated from the Father spiritually when he said, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He was separated. And then he went born from the dead, the first born from the dead, praise God. It even talks about this over in Hebrews when it says, Which of the angels said he at any time, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. Born, got, got you born. What is this talking about? This isn't talking about the day that he came into the earth as a baby. Again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son again. That means he wasn't for a while. Now he is again. That's because Jesus was dead and separated from the Father, and now he came into relationship back with him, being born again. And when he brings in the first begotten into the world, that all the angels of God worship him. Who's that? The firstborn of all creation. Jesus was the firstborn from the dead. So, that tells you something. We have an inheritance now that belongs to us that you and I are to take hold of as we have now a brand new spirit because that's the only way Jesus had to be born again to come into the priesthood through spiritual birth. Now, in order to come and possess this inheritance, Hebrews 6, verse 12, be not slothful, that's talking to us, but followers of them who through faith and patience inherit the promise. That means you and I have to do something to see these promises come to pass. Not only do we need to get ourselves cleansed and get, all, get ourselves holy before the Lord by doing what His Word says, but also we're going to use our faith, and what is patience? It is the word, Greek word makrothumia, which means long-suffering. Unfortunately, it's translated patience there. It's not the best. It's used 14 times in the Greek, 12 times translated correctly, long-suffering, macrothumia. Two times patience, this is one of them, kind of just distorts the understanding. Inherit. Does this mean I just inherited it one shot? No. It is a process of you possessing the promises of God as you are working out your own salvation and taking hold of those promises to see them come to pass in your life. How do we know? Because it's a present tense verb. It literally says, who through faith and, pay, and, and long suffering are inheriting, because it's a present tense verb, the promises. 
That's an ongoing work, isn't it? You and I are inheriting the promises of God in our life. We're taking hold of all of those things, and that's what God wants. You and I are going to do this, and this brings us to another point. One last scripture before we conclude. Revelation 21. Remember we talked about in Revelation 2 and 3 about the guy who conquers and carries off the victory? That's important for us in our life. But look what it says in Revelation 21, 7. He that overcometh, this is the word conquer, and carries off the victory. It is a present tense verb, which means he's conquering and carrying off the victory continually, area after area after area, just the way he's walking. He shall inherit all things. What all things? All the things that are ours, which are all the promises of God. They legally belong to us in Christ because all things are ours. I'll give you the scripture on that. 1 Corinthians 3, 21. When it speaks of all things in scripture, you've got to understand it's all the inherited things that belong to us, all the promises. All things are yours. This is why what it's talking about in prayer in Matthew chapter 21 in verse 22, when it says all things, what all things? All things that belong to you in Christ. Can you take hold of anything that's not given to you in Christ as a promise? No. Not all things that exist. All things that are yours. They're the promises of God. And how do we take hold of them? Remember, we do it in prayer. That's why this is a prayer scripture. Remember the Iteo and the Lombano? It's used here. Ask, Iteo, demand of what's due you. Receive, Lombano. This says, whatsoever you shall make a demand of what's due you in prayer, believing you shall take hold of it, all things that belong unto you. God wants us to take hold of everything. But coming back to Revelation 21, look what he says in verse 7. He that is conquering continually and carrying off the victory, is what this means, See, conquer is a better understanding of this word. Overcoming is like overcame it, but then it could cause me another problem again. No. We're talking about conquering and carrying off the victory and see this put underfoot and eliminated from our life. He that conquers and carries off the victory. Remember? We got a covenant from the Old Testament name, Jehovah Nisi, which is the covenant of victory that we talked about, the covenant-keeping name, shall inherit all things every promise, and I'll be his God, and he shall be my son. See, God wants us to enter into every promise. It's your inheritance that belongs to you in Christ. You and I are to be a partaker of this divine, of all that belongs, every promise that belongs to us. And remember, Jesus is an heir of all things, which makes what? You and I an heir of all things. But if we're going to enter into it and possess it, what do we need to do? We've got to meet his conditions. So what's the conditions for how the covenant works and to be able to enter into the inheritance? Well, first of all, you've got a covenant and covenant relationship, which is through new birth. You've come into a relationship. Now you're an heir of God. It belongs to you legally. But at the same time, just because you have this inheritance reserved in heaven for you and it belongs to you legally, what must you do? You've got to grow up in the things of God. Because if you haven't grown up in the things of God, you're still a nepios, you're still an infant, and you're just like a servant, and even though you're Lord of all, you haven't entered into anything. You've got to get the knowledge of God and be a hearer and a doer of the Word. And if you don't learn to get experience in the Word of righteousness, as we saw, you'll continue to be a nepios, a baby, spiritually, which means you're still a servant and you're not possessing the promises of God. We've got to get the Word of God, the knowledge of God, into us and do what the Word says. We also are going to put the angels in operation by doing his commandments and praying the word that are going to bring forth all the inherited promises that belong to us, for, the, for us, he ministers to us, they minister for us, the heirs of salvation. Your heir of the kingdom, which means you're supposed to take your position of ruling and reigning and triumph over all the enemies in your life, which means casting out the devils and destroying every work of the enemy. And it's all the, also for those who love him, remember, that's the qualifying statement, which means you keep his commandments, which means you're walking in the word. And you also are going to be one who now, as you walk according to the knowledge of God, you are going to grow up, get established in the word, which is going to build you up and give you your inheritance, 
you having been sanctified come into the place of holiness because you've dealt with the sin you've crucified the flesh you've separated yourself from the ways of this world and you're taking hold of the promises of God to see them come to pass in your life having the promises of course we cleanse ourselves from all the filthiness of flesh and spirit and we're going to be righteous because the unrighteous can't inherit the kingdom instead we are going to be doing what the word says to become a partaker of the inheritance through the Word of God as we do what the Word says, we pray the Word with faith and long-suffering, we are inheriting the promises, and we're taking hold of the promise of eternal inheritance that belongs to us, we're conquering the enemy so we can inherit all things, everything that belongs to us. You've got an inheritance. It's because of what Jesus did, who died and was the firstborn from the dead. You've come into covenant relationship with him. You have the inheritance of everything that he's inherited of, which is all things. It includes all the Old Testament promises because if you're Christ, you're Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. So all the promises of God and the word of God belong to us, period. We have to possess them. You're going to possess them when you meet the conditions, which is you doing the word, which is you working out your own salvation and doing what he says because you can't possess a promise if you're walking in sin. You can only possess a promise when you're walking right before the Lord. That's why we're going to get, deal with all sin. We're going to be cleansed. We're going to walk in His ways. We're going to pray the Word. We're going to take hold of the promises. And we're going to work out our own salvation with fear and trembling to bring forth everything that God purposes in our life. And we're going to take hold of the promises of God. Well, that's because we're going to get experience in the Word of Righteousness by doing it. As you do it, you're going to see the inherited promises of God come into manifestation in your life. Therefore, we got a covenant relationship. It's not just, oh, I'll take hold of this and ignore all the rest of these things. It doesn't work that way. It's the whole package. It's the whole package. You see, you belong to the Lord. God doesn't say, well, I'll perform this word for you, but I'm not going to do it over here. Well, that's not going to get over at all. He's going to do everything. You can't say, well, I'll do the word here, so I get this promise, but I'm not doing it over here. No, that's not going to work. You can't think that you're going to be able to take hold of the promises of God when you've got sin in the camp. No, we've got to deal with it all, don't we? Therefore, as we saw, deliverance from all these evil things precedes holiness that precedes the possession of our promises, the possessions, the promises of God in our life. And you have an inheritance. But you've got to meet the conditions, or it's not going to happen. This is why God wants you to, to get in the Word and walk, work out your own salvation, walk in His ways, so you can possess everything. Remember, the one who conquers will inherit all things. You've got to conquer sin. You've got to conquer the flesh. You've got to conquer the world. You've got to conquer the devil. This is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. Your faith will conquer everything. That's why you're going to do everything by faith. You're going to possess everything that God has for you, your inheritance. But we got to do it God's ways. We're going to build our spiritual house. We're going to grow up in the things of God. And we're going to work out our salvation and see everything that God has promised come to pass in our life. You do it God's way, you're going to see it. And you're going to inherit all things. And God will be God to you and you will be a son. Praise God. Say this, Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you that I understand that in covenant relationship I have an inheritance because of what Jesus got for me and as an heir of all things all the promises of God have already been given to me they belong to me in order to, to possess them I meet the conditions of the Word of God to possess the promises of the covenant. I will do what the Word says. I will conquer in all areas and I will inherit the promises. I will pray in line with the New Testament. I will take hold of every promise. I will do what your Word says and you will give me the inheritance and I will be holy before you, sanctified because I've dealt with every enemy I'm crucifying that flesh, conquering all sin, totally separate from the world, putting the Word of God first place, 
as I walk that walk, I will take hold of the promise. Because as I walk that walk, I will grow up in all things. I will become a spiritual man in Christ, walking in the ways of the Lord. And I will take hold of everything that belongs to me in Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord, for the great inheritance, for the new covenant. I'm going to take hold of all the promises. I'm not going to let any promise be left out. I will receive them all. Thank you, Lord, for performing your word. The covenant promises as my inheritance as I conquer and meet all the conditions. So I inherit all things. And I will, you will be my God. And I will be your child. In Jesus' name. Amen. Praise God. Most people that teach on inheritance think that just, oh, inheritance, I'll just take a promise and do whatever I want to do. They wonder why it never happened. We never grew up in the things of God. Never did what the Word says. But when we look at the Word, it makes it pretty clear. Babies aren't going to be able to take hold of anything. You've got to grow up in the things of God. People walking in sin, it's not going to happen. They try to take hold of anything, they'll end up losing it. They won't see it anyway. We're going to walk in the ways of the Word. See, that's why he says you've got to become holy. God would never command us to be holy if we couldn't be holy. And remember, holiness precedes possessing the promises of the new covenant, the inheritance that belongs to us in Christ. That's why we major on doing the word, hearing the word, and doing the word, working out our own salvation, conquering in all areas, as in taking hold of every promise, and speaking it to being, doing the word, becoming strong, getting rid of every devil, casting them all out, so we can get set free and possess everything that God has for us. And he will give you your inheritance, and it will come to pass. Father, we thank you and praise you for all that you brought forth. Thank you for the understanding we have an inheritance in Christ, and when we meet the conditions, we'll see it come to pass, and we will conquer and possess all the inherited promises that belong to us. Thank you for bringing these to pass in our life as we're hearers and doers of this word. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. We've got more to talk about on the subject of covenants. Because we're going to see there's a lot of things that we see throughout the Word where it says, if you do this, then I'll do this. That's a, essentially a statement of covenant. God's part and my part. If I do this, then he says he'll do this. We need to know all those. Now, they're pretty important. Because if I'm not doing my part, how can I expect God to do his part? Therefore, we've got to look at the Scriptures that say, if you do this, then I will do this. And that's what we're going to be looking at as we are beginning on Wednesday night. Praise God. Hallelujah. If you need prayer, I want to invite you to come forward. I trust this has been an encouragement to you at the same time showing you that we all need to be about doing what the Lord wants so we can see everything come to pass in our life. Need prayer? I invite you to come forward. Otherwise, God bless. Wednesday night, we're going to continue on this, and we'll talk about if and how all the ifs and then all the things that we get to take hold of as we meet the conditions. God bless you. You're dismissed. Have a great week.